place lit up. said had been created on the earth, a new challenge for humanity. Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to men. For this, he was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. And that's how Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer begins, with a retelling of the myth of Prometheus foreshadowing the tragic life of Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the American Prometheus. He was known to history as the father of the atomic bomb, the director of Los Alamos, the scientist who gave mortal man the power of the sun. After watching Oppenheimer in IMAX, I felt like I really wanted to talk about this intimate journey that we had with this man that is described by countless contradictions from his successors to his downfall as the so-called American Prometheus, and how all of that relates to the world today. The motion picture spectacle of all time. Tons of water alive with deadly rays, awe inspiring in its significance for man who learned how to control the atom but must now learn to control himself. There is but one defense against the atom bomb, and that is distance. And distance will mean nothing without world peace. In Oppenheimer, Nolan no longer just flirts with the idea of the father of the atomic bomb like in Tenet. Think of our scientist as her generation's Oppenheimer where a bomb could kill through time or just showcasing a small part of World War II or how a single hero stop an atomic bomb in the dark night rises. I feel like Christopher Nolan is really preoccupied with the idea of a man-made weapon of mass destruction, self-annihilation. Moreover, this movie has a lot of Christopher Nolan elements from the haunting score by Ludwig Göransson of adding a sense of importance to each of these historic moments that happened decades ago and how those events reverberate throughout history just like the score escalating throughout the movie. But the haunting silence during the Trinity test was louder than any score. Unlike a documentary, Christopher Nolan wanted to make it clear that this was told from Oppenheimer's subjective point of view. We see this with him feeling completely naked from his privacy being violated during the trial to not seeing the actual explosion himself, only hearing about it on the radio. Or from the story unfolding itself non-chronologically, unlike the Pulitzer Prize winner book it was based on. I don't think Nolan did this to make it more convoluted but to emphasize certain ideas. He wants to show you who these people were and what they were thinking eight decades ago in a way that a straightforward story couldn't do. Because how a story unfolds itself is very important, it could be used to say something like showing scene B moments after scene A could create idea C in the collective minds of the audience. And Oppenheimer had a lot to say all throughout its three hour runtime. It really puts you in the headspace of the man who ran Los Alamos and it puts ideas, ideas that what happened in 45 was one of the most impactful parts of history. Because this is the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world. What happens to stars when they die? Do stars die? Well, if they do, they cool, then collapse, in fact, the bigger the star, the more violent its demise. The gravity gets so concentrated it swallows 
Can that really happen? We start off the movie with a young Oppenheimer staring into the ripples of raindrops and imagining an entire hidden world full of atoms. And it's this theoretical world where he can hear the music and after his time at Gottingham, he could fully blossom into one of the greatest physicists of his time. Oppenheimer may not have won a Nobel Prize even though he was the first person to write about black holes, but this publication would sadly happen on the same day that Germany would openly start its conquest across Europe. He was passionate about sharing knowledge and pushing others to science. And in his studies, he would become a professor at Caltech and Berkeley. And this is where he would pioneer theoretical physics in America, where he would slowly gain a reputation that would attract a certain US general. Here we are introduced to Matt Damien's General Groves. He was looking for a director to run the Manhattan Project and he came looking for Oppenheimer because he needed someone who could lead the people capable of unleashing the strong force. Oppenheimer understood a lot of fields including physics, chemistry, metallurgy, engineering. Oppenheimer may not have had a Nobel Prize at the time but he had a particular type of charisma. And in general, Groves knew he needed someone like that to lead the project because you needed someone that the scientific community could respect and rally around. And Oppenheimer was in the right place at the right time, especially when the Nazis were ahead by over a year. We have a 12 month head start. 18, deep hockey, straight race, the Germans win. We've got one hope, which is anti Semitism. What? Hitler called quantum physics and Jewish science said right to Einstein's face. Our one hope is that Hitler is so, so blinded by hate that he's denied Heisenberg proper resources because it'll take vast resources. Our nation's best scientists working together right now, they're scattered. Oppenheimer was right when he said this. German universities were leading the field of theoretical physics at the time, but during Hitler's rise to power, there was an exodus of brilliance from the fascist nations when a lot of scientists were no longer welcome, including Edward Teller, Klaus Fuchs, Leo Slizat, Enrico Fermi, Max Born, and Einstein. Not all the scientists that left were German citizens, but it's the idea of isolating a nation that limited Germany's progress on creating atomic weapons. And history will remember that it was the Allies who won the race for the bomb. And we see this theme of open collaboration being shown throughout the film that if mankind just came together and worked towards a common goal, mankind could achieve anything. I think the only hope for our future safety must lie in a collaboration based on confidence and good faith with the other peoples of the world. As Oppenheimer once stated to a friend, my two great loves are physics and New Mexico. It's a pity they can't be combined. But he did fuse these two when he suggested Los Salamos, New Mexico as the secret site where the infamous gadget would be developed. And thus, P.O. Box 1663 would be the birthplace of atomic weapons and hundreds of children including Oppenheimer's own daughter. Over 700 scientists would be recruited to be a part of the Greater Manhattan Project with most of them living at Los Alamos. Industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. Secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's dark. And in the span of just three years, Los Alamos would produce the world's first three atomic bombs, known to history as the Fat Man, the Little Boy, and the Gadget. They called the test bomb the Gadget almost like they wanted to distance themselves from calling it a bomb a weapon of mass destruction. We know that Oppenheimer married Kitty, but before that he dated Jean Tadlock. She would sadly commit suicide shortly after her final meeting with Oppenheimer. And in the movie, we are unsure if it was an actual suicide as you can see in Oppenheimer's imagination that there's a frame. 
dream that hand over Jean Catlock, and there is a theory that her suicide was staged because the U.S. was afraid that Catlock might share secrets with the Soviets, and we see Oppenheimer feeling a lot of guilt for her death, either for that or for not being there for her. Site. Oppenheimer named it after a poem by John Donne, Better My Heart Tree Person God. John Donne was a poet introduced to Oppenheimer by Jean Tadlock. Trinity Site will be where the gadget will be detonated. The Trinity test was initially scheduled for 4 a.m. so that it could be observed with minimum interference from the sun. But we see in the movie that there was a delay, there was a storm, but we know that a real storm came after the explosion. And in the morning of July 16, 1945, the slumbering energy that lies dormant in the atom will be unleashed by mankind in the morning desert of New Mexico. And mankind officially entered the atomic age, and the atomic genie was let out of its bottle. But we mustn't fool ourselves. The world is not going to be the same, no matter what we do with atomic bombs, because the knowledge of how to make them cannot be exorcised. Realize, you know, this is a moment in the Manhattan Project where Oppenheimer and his fellow scientists couldn't completely rule out the possibility of the chain reaction that would set fire to the atmosphere before they conducted the treasure test. And yet they, they went ahead and pushed that button. But ultimately, I just thought, what a dramatic moment. I mean, what an incredible thing for them to have done. And what would it be like to take the audience that would be like to be there? I had a moment where it looked like the chain reaction from an atomic device might never stop it. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. Nolan literally put us in the same room as the people who pushed the first red button. We can see all of the mixed emotions on the faces of these people, the anxiety before fission, the awe of that flash, the satisfaction of three years of hard work, the manifestation of three centuries of physics. They were the people who felt the shockwave for the first ever nuclear explosion and that shockwave would linger forever as the specter of nuclear holocaust. And in the atomic age, the default state of the world was forever changed and the context, the context of every peace and every war now carried a heavier weight. <laughs> Because now it would only take a few trigger happy people in the chain of command to set off Armageddon itself. People would now grow up in a time where the ever looming threat of nuclear annihilation was the default. It was the new normal. The end of the world was no longer depicted as natural disasters. Now, the end of civilization itself would be man-made and it starts with a blinding flash of light. Now, the end would happen around the world in a matter of minutes. Now, cities would be turned to ash in the matter of seconds. Their work forever changed the world on July 16, 1945 and no one knew it yet. Three weeks later, the first and second usage of nuclear weapons would occur in the span of three days. The United States of America now had two nuclear bombs. This means they will be needing two targets. A meeting was held on May 12, 1945 before the test to decide the cities where the power of Manhattan itself would be unleashed. How many victims will there be? This is where the US would select 
the victims of the first and second atomic bomb. During this time, Oppenheimer believed that scientists should only advise on scientific matters and leave the decisions regarding politics and war to the people, quote, more qualified. In the movie, we see this meeting take place. Two cities will be chosen by the people in this room. Two cities, quote, which the Air Force would be willing to reserve for our use. Don't underestimate the psychological impact of, a, of an atomic explosion. A pillar of fire, 10,000 feet tall, deadly neutron effects for a mile in all directions from one single device. Dropped from a barely noticed B-29, the atomic bomb will be a terrible revelation of divine power. If that's true, it would be definitive. World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. Military targets. But there aren't any big enough. It was agreed that psychological factors were of great importance. They wanted to obtain the greatest psychological effect against Japan and making the initial use sufficiently spectacular for the importance of the weapon to be internationally recognized. It was agreed that for the initial use of the weapon, any small and strictly military objective should be located in a much larger area subject to blast damage in order to avoid undue risk of the weapon being lost due to bad placing of the bomb. They wanted military targets surrounded by people, by civilians, collateral damage was desirable. General Groves was initially suggesting Kyoto as the main target. It was first on the list because it was quote, an urban industrial area with a population of over 1 million. It is the former capital of Japan and many people and industries are now being there. From the psychological point of view, there is the advantage that Kyoto is an intellectual center for Japan and the people there are more apt to appreciate the significance of such a weapon as the gadget. But for one reason or another, the Secretary of War avoided Kyoto for its cultural significance. We have a list of 12 cities to choose from. I'm sorry, 11. I have taken Kyoto off the list due to its cultural significance to the Japanese people. Also, my wife and I honeymooned there. It's a magnificent city. This scene may or may not be historically accurate, but I love that Christopher Nolan just lingers here for just an extra second. It hauntingly implies that the people in power could just make decisions that could impact millions of lives. Decisions that will be recorded in history could be decided on so casually. Sorry, 11. I've taken Kyoto off the list due to its cultural significance to the Japanese people. Also, my wife and I honeymooned there. It's a magnificent city. Just look at these three scientists. Bruh. Let me make this simple. But as a result, Kyoto wasn't selected. One million civilians would not be the target of a single atomic bomb. So Hiroshima and Kokura were selected for being military targets that had a significant population that was quote, big enough. But after several flyby attempts, either due to smoke screens or bad weather, luck has spared Kokura. 
because the B-29 bomber carrying the fat man couldn't get a clean shot so they had to resort to bombing their secondary target, Nagasaki. Oppenheimer didn't like the idea of their second atomic bombing because he felt a singular bomb was enough to show the world the horrors of atomic weapons and history will remember that among the 80,000 victims of the second bomb, the fat man, only 150 were military personnel. atomic weapons, wars will cease. And that is not a small thing. Is it big enough to end the war? To end the war? Niels Bohr argued that the threat of atomic warfare should naturally usher in an age of openness and cooperation that the world will naturally be united afterwards. I'm not here to help, Robert. Why did you come? To talk about after. The power you're about to reveal will forever outlive the Nazis. And the world is not prepared. At the time, in the minds of these scientists, they believed that mankind wouldn't be foolish enough to actually use these weapons after seeing what had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No country would be mad enough to actually use nuclear bombs. We have to make the politicians understand this isn't a new weapon. It's a new world. I'll be out there doing what I can, but you, you are an American Prometheus. The men who gave them the power to destroy themselves, and they'll respect that. With hindsight, we know it was a naive assumption. However, in some ways, they were right. There hasn't been another war as deadly as World War II. No one wanted to be the fools to repeat history. Because of this paradox of deterrence, this idea that it's the willingness to destroy each other, the deterrence of the sword was the thing that stops war. It's the madness in mutually assured destruction. And for some reason, with a few close calls and a lot, a lot of luck, it has been working for decades. The Cold War never went hot. We all know that when different nations are struggling for power, anything can happen. We mustn't forget that. We can't forget that so many different countries have the, the power, power to destroy themselves. And Oppenheimer, this calm man of science, wanted the bombs to be used and he wanted the first use of atomic weapons to be ugly, as ugly as the annals of history will allow it. No longer the enemy who are the greatest threat to mankind, it's our work. It was dead. It's true. But the Japanese fight on. We're theorists. We imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. They won't fear it until they understand it, and they won't understand it until they've used it. When the world learns the terrible secret of Los Alamos, our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. A peace based on the kind of international cooperation that Roosevelt always envisaged. Few things are as ugly as a guilty conscience. He wanted this to be the first 
and last time that these weapons will be ever used on people. He wanted history to remember them as vividly as possible that the last time that these weapons were used in 1945, over 200,000 civilians died. And in his later years, he framed atomic weapons as weapons of aggressors and he pushed for global cooperation so that Hiroshima and Nagasaki would never repeat. It was the revelation of the Trinity Test that science is something that we must fear and respect. Mankind must learn to move forward with it and never forget the lessons that we learn from history. I don't believe any of the scientists at Los Alamos wanted to become scientists so that they could build weapons. They were not soldiers. I'm not a soldier, I'll be a soldier. They were scientists. They were scientific explorers racing into uncharted territory, a whole new branch of science unknown to man, to make sure that the Nazis wouldn't be the first to monopolize the power of the atom. against the Nazis, and I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. You drop a bomb that falls on the just and the unjust. I don't wish the culmination of three centuries of physics to be a weapon of mass destruction. Technology itself can't be moral or immoral, it's just a tool. Just like a boat, it's up to the captain to decide where it goes and what it will be used for. It can either become a fishing boat used to feed a community or a battleship used for war. Similarly, humanity discovered new types of warfare during the Iron Age. But the blacksmiths that made swords that led to the death of millions were not evil. It's how humanity uses these discoveries that defines what we are. Just like the first humans to build boats didn't know that they were unlocking an entire new branch of technology that could lead to so much more. At the time, they didn't know boats would unlock so many more new resources or that seafaring could be used to connect the world. But maybe this is a problem because we are still too early as a civilization to have access to something as drastic as nuclear weapons. Maybe we were advanced too far down a specific path before we were civilized enough, before we were stable enough or unified enough as a species. 
The same way that children shouldn't be allowed to drive, whether we like it or not, we have been in the driver's seat with nuclear weapons for decades, and we can only hope that we are lucky enough to know how to stop before we crash. If there is another world war, the civilization may go under. We need to ask ourselves whether we're doing all we can to avert that. I might like to read what my grandfather said about it. This is a speech where he said, but when you come right down to it, the reason that we did this job is because it was an organic necessity. If you are a scientist, you cannot stop such a thing. If you are a scientist, you believe that it's good to find out how the world works, that it's good to find out what realities are. It is good to turn over to mankind the greatest possible power to control the world and deal with it according to its lights and values. Science is amoral. It's never good and it's never bad. No branch of science is off limits. It's why and how technology is invented that defines it. It can be used for good as long as responsible ethics are taken into consideration, but can a weapon be ethical? Were the secrets of the atom forbidden? The only way for us to understand what's beyond the horizon is to sail there, and it's that scientific curiosity and it's that desire to understand the world that makes us human. He didn't regret his role and work during the war, but he soon after turned so strongly towards managing the outcome of the science they created. He understood that no one could stop progress. The day that they found out that fission was possible, nuclear weapons would be a reality sooner or later, and the race for madness had begun. So now the race is against the Soviets. Not unless we start it. Robert, they just fired a starting gun. And as the bombs were being shipped out, Oppenheimer knew that the US didn't need him at Los Salamos anymore. The Manhattan Project has been plagued from the start by certain scientists of doubtful discretion and uncertain loyalty. One of them just tried to meet with the president. Now, we need these men, but as soon as it's practical, we should sever any such scientists from the program. Wouldn't you agree, doctor? And as the father of the atomic bomb, Oppenheimer wished that his creations could be used for something other than destruction, just like the inventor of dynamite, Alfred Nobel. History will judge us, Robert. But the captain was no longer in control of his ship, and the people who will decide the fate of nuclear weapons in the coming years will be two very, very different competing nations. And in the following years, he would be advisor to the US Atomic Energy Commission. He would try his best at nuclear arms control, but his best was not enough. Today, there have been over 2,000 successful nuclear tests carried all across the world by nine different countries. The US alone carried out over 1,000 tests in less than a century. The Russians have a bomb. Just like generative AI, the genie is not out of the bottle and there's no way to unlearn it. Mankind can only move forward into an unfamiliar world until society learns to adapt to it.
especially when we have come so far as a species. But we must not ignore the fact that no matter how bright the future may seem, we must not slow our efforts of world peace, because that bright flash could be the end of humanity. Just like how Oppenheimer imagined, it's in that theoretical world of endless possibilities where he once heard music, he now just sees the horrifying consequences that in theory he had already destroyed the world. In Greek mythology, Pandora's box was prepared by Zeus, and it contained all of the evils of the world, but Pandora opened that box out of a sense of curiosity, and it's one of the most iconic metaphors of the extreme consequences of what curiosity can unleash onto the world. And the Manhattan Project had unleashed the energy that was trapped in the atom because they could. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Weapons can't be unmade and they are always used. These three bombs would only be the first of thousands. So many nuclear explosions would be carried out in the coming decades. And if aliens could only observe our planet by the sheer amount of atomic explosions, they would assume we were already waging a violent war across the globe. The atomic age came in with a bang, a bang that was felt all around the world and the world was no longer the same. not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered 
read the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Some historians believe that the bombs were not necessary, that they only sped up the surrender by a few months, and that the bombs should never have been dropped. But history is never that simple. When we talk about historic events, we need to remember that they did not have hindsight. They only knew what they knew, and information was limited. The US believed that the only way for Japan to stop their war effort across Asia was to force a surrender with a major invasion, which would cost the lives of over a million soldiers on both sides. But when President Truman was told about the success of the Trinity test, he now had another option, an option that would seem like it would force a surrender without spilling the blood of American soldiers. This seems like the most appealing option because he was facing public pressure to end the war as soon as possible. Truman now had a dilemma. If he didn't drop the bombs, if the American public found out that over 2 billion taxpayer dollars and 3 years went into the development of bombs that could have ended the war earlier, and he instead chose to send hundreds of thousands of Americans to invade mainland Japan for another year, it would be a bad look. He was even informed by the Secretary of War that the bombs would be used air quotes strategically and it would demonstrate to the world that the US had a bomb of unusual destructive force, something that the Russians didn't have. It was almost too obvious that he would decide to allow the bombs to be dropped and allowed it he did even though the bombs were already planned before he gave explicit permission. And on July 26, the Allies issued the Potsdam Declaration, which called for the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces. Other key points of the declaration included the elimination of authority and influence of the Japanese militarists, destruction of Japanese war-making capabilities, the occupation of allied designated areas of the Japanese homeland, adherence to the terms of the Cairo Declaration, which includes strip Japan of all territories seized since the beginning of the First World War. Japan's government to be established by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. Complete disarming of Japanese military forces. These demands would not be accepted as most of the Supreme Council deciding on the terms of surrender were military personnel and these demands would be stripping Japan of its military force and the militarists would lose all of their power and purpose. While I was researching the period around the surrender, I read a lot of documents and papers and I came across Unit 731. They were planning a biological attack on California code name Operation Cherry Blossom Night. This attack was scheduled for September, but luckily we know that Japan surrendered a few weeks just before they could unleash the bubonic plague in the US. Unit 731 was basically a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit that carried out human experiments that killed between 200,000 
and 300,000 civilians of war. This video is already longer than I would have liked, so if you would like to know more about this topic, I recommend these two videos by Windy Goon and Hello Future Me. They do a far better job at explaining what can happen during wartime than I can do in this short segment of the video. So why did Japan surrender? We should never simplify history by saying that the bombs were the sole reason why Japan surrendered or that the bombs were not necessary. There's a lot of people who say that atomic weapons were not necessary for the surrender of Japan but when we look back at history, we shouldn't simplify events. History has a lot of complicated moving parts, each event affecting another. Japan knew they were not winning the war militarily, they knew that they were just delaying the conclusion. But defeat and surrender were two very different things. They were passively open to peace but that doesn't mean they were negotiating for peace. Japan's response to the Port Sam Declaration was basically to ignore it because there wasn't a unified response in their leadership, even after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were open to peace talks but that doesn't mean they would accept an unconditional surrender like their ally Nazi Germany. Even after Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th, even after the Russians broke their non-aggression pact on the 8th, even after Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki on the 9th, they were nowhere close to surrendering. After several days of talks, the cabinet was still in deadlock. Some wanted to keep on fighting, some wanted to negotiate peace where war crimes would be trialed internally, but they were still not open to unconditional surrender. They were still in deadlock. On the other hand, the emperor wanted peace, but the emperor normally would not intervene in the matters of state. But on the 14th of August, five days after Nagasaki, the emperor made it clear. Despite ambiguities concerning the imperial institution, he directed the council to accept the surrender terms and most of the Supreme Court would not go against the wish of the Emperor. But on that same day, there was a military coup that wanted to keep on fighting. History will remember this day as the Kujo Incident, also known as the last day of World War II. This was a very complicated event, so I recommend this video by War Graphic that summarizes the entire event. But basically, with the support of thousands of soldiers, the leader of the coup, Major Kenji Hatanaka, murdered Lieutenant General Takeshi Mori of the 1st Imperial Guards Division. He then captured the Imperial Palace and attempted to stop the Emperor from broadcasting the surrender, but luckily the coup was a failure and Japan was able to surrender. And a few hours later, for the first time, Japan heard the voice of its emperor being broadcasted across the nation. This is a portion of the broadcast translated. The enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bar. The power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, it would not only result in the ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but it would lead to the total extinction of the human civilization. Such being the case, how are we to save millions of our subjects or to atone ourselves before the hallowed spirits of our imperial ancestors? This is the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the joint declaration of the powers. We are keenly aware of the inmost feelings of all ye, our subjects. The bombs even had the unintended effect of allowing the military to save face. It framed that Japan didn't lose the war militarily, but they lost in terms of science. The Americans didn't have the courage 
all the honor to invade Japan and had to shamelessly bomb civilians, denying the Japanese military their honorable last stand. In the emperor's speech, he even framed it as Japan honorably putting down its sword to avoid the total extinction of the human civilization. While researching, I have gone through so many documents from many different perspectives. And it's very clear that there was no singular reason, it was a combination of many things. Months of awareness that they were losing, the Russians no longer being neutral, the desire to avoid a fate similar to Germany, a desire for a better future after the war, months of civilian bombings, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, a bomb that could destroy the very city where the emperor and council were. So many things had to happen that the emperor had to intervene to declare a surrender that the US would accept. Whether it was necessary or not, the bombs had left their mark on history, not only for the countries involved but the entire world. And hopefully, that will be the last time that humanity will ever use atomic weapons. Otherwise, the next entries won't just be two cities. I read that a lot of people online found that the later half of the movie to be boring and unnecessary but I totally disagree. The film is called Oppenheimer for a reason and his story doesn't end when he leaves Los Alamos. He continued to play a big part in atomic policy and the story continues with how his meddling in politics led to his downfall. Moreover, you can't tell the story of the father of the atomic bomb without touching the wider implications of his invention. And the story of nuclear weapons doesn't end at Nagasaki. The horrors of atomic bombs doesn't end at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It only begins there. One man didn't build the bomb. It was the effort of hundreds of scientists all around the world and the culmination of centuries of knowledge. But Oppenheimer was the director of the project, so if anyone were to hold the most responsibility among the scientists, it would be him. He would be filled with immense guilt, but he was very careful to not say he regretted his part in the construction of the bombs, because regret and guilt are two very different things. Especially after meeting President Truman, it became crystal clear to Oppenheimer that Truman didn't fully understood the ramification that the bombs would have on the world moving forward. Truman cared more about how the bombs could be used to solidify US dominance in the global landscape than how it would be regulated. And Oppenheimer even accidentally offended the president when he said he had blood on his hands. It was like saying Truman had even more blood because he was the one who ordered it and Truman no longer wanted to get involved with Oppenheimer, even calling him a crybaby scientist. But that would only be the start of Oppenheimer's political career as he later humiliated Louis Strauss. And by 1953, Oppenheimer had many political enemies, especially during the Red Scare. Here we see Louis Strauss start his devious plan to discredit Oppenheimer, stripping his security clearance through an internal trial. Most of this part of the movie is told in black and white, because the parts with color are Oppenheimer's subjective point of view, especially when we see his fears as he's forced to imagine the implication of his invention. This is where we see more of Robert Downey's Jr.'s performance as Louis Strauss, a vindictive bureaucrat who, unlike Oppenheimer, saw the world in black and white. We slowly learn more about the so-called trial, how the systematic destruction of Oppenheimer's credibility was carried out by several elites so that he can never have any influence in atomic policy in the coming years. 
It starts off with Strauss giving documents to Bolden so that he could write a letter about his Echo's communist suspicions about Oppenheimer so that Nichols, with this reason, would not approve his security clearance, forcing Oppenheimer to make a move. There was no trial in the myth of Prometheus. Zeus had already decided his fate. The same happened in real life. Oppenheimer's fate was already sealed. He was forced to fight. But why did this matter to not fight? This claim is like a public admission that he was in the wrong, that he could not be trusted as an American. And no one should listen to what this untrustworthy scientist had to say. How could an untrusted man like him be allowed to be advisor to the US Atomic Energy Commission? But it was a fight that he could never have won. It was not a legal trial. It was a security hearing. It was a kangaroo court. Robert, you can't win this thing. It's a kangaroo court with a predetermined outcome. Why put yourself through more of it? I had my reasons. Good night. He has a point. I'm not sure you understand, Albert. No? I left my country, never took it down. You served your country well. If this is the reward she offers you, then perhaps you should turn your back on her. Oppenheimer had made a major mistake. He thought he had a chance. He believed in himself. He trusted his government. But during the Red Scare, during that period of time in America, civil rights were only a suggestion. During a real trial, there's normally a discovery period where both parties have to reveal all the information that they had regarding the charges. But this isn't a trial. The ending was already written in advance. Nothing that Oppenheimer did could ever defend himself. And Oppenheimer's entire life was picked apart. He felt naked. He was humiliated. He had no rights to privacy. No individual, no matter how famous, no matter how brilliant, could stand against the United States of America. And you have to remember that during this time, Oppenheimer was arguably the world's most famous scientist at the time. During this time, he embraced his persona as the father of the atomic bomb and he appeared on several covers for prominent magazines. He was so famous that some people even associated him with the pork pie hat. And Oppenheimer became almost like a martyr for the scientific community and indicated that our government did not respect and did not care for what the scientific community had to say. It sent a message across the scientific community that scientists were not allowed in politics. They were only allowed to do their jobs if the state allowed it. In the first few years of the atomic age, the United States would monopolize atomic weapons. But all of the scientists knew it was only a matter of time before the Russians would catch up. And on 29th August 1949, four years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Soviet Union conducted its first successful weapon test called First Lightning. And the United States was no longer the only nation that was in possession of atomic bombs. Now, there was a balance of terror. Most scientists wanted open collaboration to ensure peace, but this didn't make sense to the politicians. So the US now had its sights on the hydrogen bomb. The super. We see this scene where they would nonchalantly draw circles on this map. Each circle representing the death of millions of civilians. 
Oppenheimer being the person to open the door would try to argue that it was impractical and unethical because the explosion was so big that the only targets were major city centers. Edward Teller was the scientist to advocate for the hydrogen bomb. He was against communism and he saw that this was the only way to deter the Soviets from gaining any more power. And of course, all of the politicians agreed. Now it was a race for a bomb that was bigger, a bomb that was better, a better way to destroy the world. On the 30th of October 1961, the king of bombs, the Tsar bomb, will be released. The world stood silent as the largest bomb ever known to man was detonated. Болевой столб, поднимающийся с земли, быстро увеличился в объем. Через несколько секунд после взрыва диаметр полевого столба составлял около 10 километров. Comparison, the first nuclear weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima, the little boy, was only 15 kilotons, and it was a tragedy. But the Tsar bomb was 50 megatons, several magnitudes more powerful. This demonstration of power was only half the destructive force it could theoretically achieve, because any larger and what was released that day would have endangered the pilots. For practical reasons, it was only 50 megatons. There's rarely a need for a 100 megaton explosion. Luckily, these weapons were never used in war. But the story of the atomic age still has so many pages left empty, and this chapter of humanity will not end until we close it. Через несколько секунд после взрыва диаметр полевого столба составлял около 10 километров. If there is another world war, the civilization may go under. Mutually Assured Destruction MAD This has been the default for over 70 years. We have been minutes away from the end of the world. The doomsday clock is a metaphor created by the bulletin of atomic scientists that represented how close we are to the end of the world, midnight. And a lot of things can affect how close we are to midnight. But this year, 2023, we are only 90 seconds away from midnight itself, the closest it has ever been in history. 
with the effects of climate change from decades of neglect, several technological and biological threats, with the war in Ukraine forcing its European neighbours to start preparing for the potential of war. And this type of Cold War is extremely complex with so many nations with differing ideals with nine different countries pointing thousands of warheads at each other where tensions are this high even if a small portion of these nukes were to launch a nuclear winter would occur. No wonder we are only 90 seconds away from midnight. The race started because of the Germans and 80 years later that race still hasn't concluded. Oppenheimer tried so hard to advocate for nuclear arms control but how big a difference can one man make? He just wanted a world where everyone could say, I have no enemies. But luckily, this isn't a normal clock. It may be showing how close we are to annihilation, but it's also showing us hope that it's not too late. We still have a chance as long as it never hits midnight. We can still push the end of the world back. Unquestionably, he changed the world. And he changed the world forever. There's no going back. But we know that as long as men are free to ask what they will, free to say what they think, free to think what they must, science will never regress. And freedom itself will never be wholly lost. I really love how the movie ends. It ends with a chain reaction after the last scene. Like many people in the cinema, I just sat there. I sat there silently with my own thoughts. Just like the prestige or inception, the movie asks questions to the audience, but Nolan won't answer it. Wanting to leave it more open-ended so that any subjective takeaway is valid because the world is never black and white. The answer is never simple. What does it mean for mankind to have nuclear weapons? The power to destroy themselves. Was it wrong to develop them? Was it wrong to use them? What does it mean to be called the father of the atomic bomb? And what can we do next to avoid nuclear winter? The movie started with Oppenheimer staring into the ripples of raindrops and it ends with him standing where Einstein once stood, hauntingly staring into the future, no longer in control of the invention that he pioneered, helpless to what it would be used for because if anyone ever pressed that button, no one could stop this chain reaction that will set the world on fire not even its creator. Sander, the realization that everyone has a story. This was a triumph. I'm making a note here, huge success. So, hey, uh, Son Sonologs here. Uh, so that's the end of the video. Uh, this is obviously a very small channel, so every single sub and like is so much more important. So if you enjoyed the video, do go like and subscribe and comment in the video. I will be reading the comments. Still have some work and some school projects, but do expect another upload around October. It's obvious English is not my first language. Uh, I will be improving it and hopefully I'll be able to find my own style a video essay. Well, that's it. I'm logging off. Goodbye and stay alive. <laughs>